I'm Dr. Orion Taraban, and this is PsychHacks, Better Living Through Psychology. And the topic of today's short talk is why most marriages fail. So we know that the divorce rate is extremely high in the Western world. More than half of marriages end in divorce, which should be an absolutely terrifying statistic for any single man in the West. Now, the reasons behind this exorbitant divorce rate are widely debated and hotly contested. And there's a good deal of validity to a lot of these points, especially those that consider the perverse incentives for women who initiate the lion's share of divorces to end their marriages. However, I have a very simple explanation as to why most marriages fail that cuts to the heart of the issue. Here it is. The reason why most marriages fail is because marriage is inherently a very humble institution. And because of its fundamental humility, it cannot support all the extra bullshit that people are subject to piling on top of that institution. Like a bridge that collapses when it takes on too much weight, marriage is just not designed to support more than what it was built to do. And at the end of the day, what a marriage was built to do is to provide a context for people to come together and raise children. That's it. Everything on top of that, everything that people are subject to piling on top of marriage, the love, the romance, the exclusivity, the duty, the religiosity, the sacrifice, the security, the legal status, the social consequences, the financial incentives, is heavier than what the institution of marriage was designed to support. And of these many things, it is love in the sense of romantic love that is heaviest to bear. The prevalence of the love marriage, which is a conflation of two very different things, the love affair and the domestic partnership, is fundamentally to blame for the situation we find ourselves in today. Marriage wasn't designed to be both a structure for raising children and a container for passion and fulfillment. That, like, just doesn't make sense. Lamborghini does not make minivans. And love is just one of many additional things with which we are inappropriately subject to burdening marriage. We see a similar trend in contemporary attitudes towards work. For instance, the function of a job is to provide people with an opportunity to earn money in exchange for a service. That's it. Everything on top of that is additional weight that the institution of a job was not designed to support. A job was not designed to be fulfilling. It was not meant to be a source of meaning. It was not meant to provide you with an identity. And it certainly wasn't designed to be exciting or fun. The institution of a job was created to provide people with the opportunity to earn money in exchange for a service. Anything on top of that is more than the institution was fundamentally designed to support. It is not necessarily a problem when a job that pays well is not fulfilling. The problem is expecting fulfillment from a job that pays well. Do you understand? Now, before I go any further, if you're liking what you're hearing, please consider sending this episode to someone who might benefit from its message because it's word of mouth referrals like this that really help to make the channel grow. You can also hit the super thanks button. It's those three little dots in the lower right hand corner and tip me in proportion to the value you feel you've derived from this episode because it's your donations that make all this happen. Thank you for your support. So, work and marriage are humble institutions. And for a very long time, marriage was basically understood to be a kind of work. That is, it was two people who joined together to accomplish a specific purpose, namely to raise children. You didn't have to love the person you were doing this with. Hell, you didn't even have to particularly like them. Much like it is unnecessary for you to love or even like your coworkers in order to do your job. You don't get to choose your coworkers, and for a long time, people didn't get to choose their spouses. But you kind of found a way to make it work because, you know, that's your job. No one really expects to work at a company where their coworkers are their best friends. That is both unrealistic and unnecessary. However, People have no problem believing that their spouses should not only be their co-parents, but also their best friends, and their passionate lovers, and their coaches, and their cheerleaders, 
and their drinking buddies and their therapists and their biggest fans and their social trophies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It should go without saying, but no one person can be all those things to anyone else. And this is why marriages fail. We want it to be more than it is, and so we expect our partners to be more than they are. One of my favorite authors, Kurt Vonnegut, had an interesting take on this. This is from one of his later collections, God Bless You, Dr. Kevorkian, and he writes, okay, now let's have some fun. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about women. Freud said that he didn't know what women wanted. I know what women want. They want a whole lot of people to talk to. What do they want to talk about? They want to talk about everything. What do men want? They want a lot of pals, and they wish people weren't so mad at them. Why are so many people getting divorced today? It's because most of us don't have extended families anymore. It used to be that when a man and a woman got married, the bride got a lot more people to talk to about everything, and the groom got a lot more pals to tell dumb jokes to. But most of us, if we get married nowadays, are just one more person for the other person. The groom gets one more pal, but it's a woman. The woman gets one more person to talk to about everything, but it's a man. The couple has an argument. They may think it's about money or power or sex or how to raise the kids or whatever. What they're really saying to each other, though, without realizing it, is this. You are not enough people. End quote. That is absolutely correct. The reason why most marriages fail is because you are not enough people. You are not supposed to be enough people. You are never designed to be enough people. And you cannot be enough people irrespective of who you are and who you decide to partner with. The idea that one relationship should replace and supersede so many other relationships is a recipe for disaster. In my opinion, for marriage to be saved, it needs to be returned to its essential state, which is one of simplicity and humility. This probably isn't going to win me a lot of fans, but we don't even have to conflate marriage with religion. Indeed, the idea that marriage isn't fundamentally a religious institution will be difficult for many people to consider, but that's the fact. For example, did you know that marriage didn't become a sacrament of the Catholic Church until 1563? 1563, that's 16 centuries after the birth of Christ. However, this isn't necessarily surprising if you understand that marriage is fundamentally an instrument of social control because it creates stability at the social level not to have a bunch of orphaned, directionless children running around. And so marriage didn't really become important to the church until the church itself became an instrument of social power and control. And on a personal note, I don't put any stock in an organizational rule that applies to the followers, but not to the leaders. Jesus was not married. And he preached that there were no husbands or wives in heaven. That is, it is an earthly institution. Nor are the leaders of his churches, popes, priests, and the like, they're not married. The Buddha was single. Judaism's greatest king, Solomon, had 500 wives. Islam's Muhammad had multiple wives, etc., etc., etc. In fact, I can't think of a founder or head of any major religion who was monogamously married. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence. So marriage got conflated with religion a few hundred years ago. Then it got conflated with love a couple hundred years ago. Then, as Vonnegut observed, it became isolated in the nuclear unit after the dissolution of the extended family about 75 years ago. And today, we're at the end of 50 years of upheaval and uncertainty about culture, gender, and tradition. Marriage today is absolutely unrecognizable from marriage several hundred years ago. Like, it's wild that we still use the same word for it. And I'm afraid that until we collectively isolate and clarify the many conflated ideas that have created this chimera of an institution, the situation will continue to deteriorate. To save marriage, we need a return to simplicity, a pragmatic open-mindedness, or both. You may disagree with me, but that's my take on it. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And if you've gotten this far, you might as well like this episode and subscribe to this channel. You may also consider becoming a channel member, a psychonaut with perks like priority review of comments or booking a paid consultation. 
As always, thank you for listening.